Let's rise up to pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for helping us to be at the Bible study today. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have a good purpose at heart for establishing the Bible study and for bringing us here. We're praying, O oh Lord, that as you've shown us mercy and you preserved our lives, and here we are to study your word. We're asking, Lord, that the study of your word will be a great blessing to every one of us in Jesus' name. That the word will cleanse us, will purify us, will purge us. And the purpose for which you are sending the word to us, teaching us every time as we come, that that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And that, Lord, in everything we do, in our relationship with you, in our receiving and assimilating the word, everything will be to your glory in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding as we look at the word of God tonight, that we'll have proper understanding. And that, Lord, understanding will apply the word to our hearts and our lives. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study today. We're in Revelation chapter 16 from verse 1. And we're studying from verse 1 to verse 11 today. Please open your Bible with me. Revelation chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways. And pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous soul upon the men which had the mark of the beast. And upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And a third angel poured out his fire upon the rivers and the fountains of waters. And they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them the blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his fire upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues with pain for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains, and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, unclean frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, verse 14. For they are the spirits of the devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of, the, of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he which watch that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and he see shame. 
And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hill out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hill. And for the plague thereof was exceeding great. I read the whole chapter to you for you to understand the fullness of the divine wrath on the beast and the worshippers of the beast. Because these will be the last days. And these will be the final outpouring of the climax of the judgment of God upon the world at the time of the great tribulation. And you will see from what we have read that as the revelation is moving towards its final climax. It is moving with fury and it is moving fast. The people of the world have rejected God's love. They've rejected God's mercy and they've spawned the grace of God. Because of that, the judgment of God and the wrath of God and indignation is coming upon them at that time of the great tribulation. And as the judgment finally comes, it comes in a great fury. And the angels that had been messengers of mercy, they become the messengers of fury and the messengers of fire. As the vials, that is the censers, and the shallow pans previously used in worship and intercession become instruments of wrath, instruments of indignation. This is one of the principles of divine action. And it is frightening to contemplate. Because you see, when God in grace and mercy sends his son and the Holy Spirit to plead and to call and to save us, if we remain unrepentant, incorrigible, and then we spawn or reject the mercy of God, then you'll find that God, who had been the Father, who had been calling us, who had showed love, now if we continue in sin and hardness of heart, instruments of mercy will become the instruments of wrath and judgment and indignation and fury for all the people that reject Christ and his salvation. This you will find all over the Bible. Let me show you a few verses of scripture in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verses 4 and 5. Romans chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. It tells us, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? It's telling us here that God shows his love. He shows his mercy. He reveals his grace. And that love and mercy is to lead us to the grace of God and the goodness of God and the salvation of the Lord. If we despise that, if we reject that, if we push that aside, if we say, no, God, stay where you are, what's your mercy, what's your grace, what's your love? I don't want any of that. And then God turns around and says, now you have rejected love and mercy. What remains? It will be wrath indignation and the judgment of God. That's what you'll find in verse 5. It says, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteousness of the righteous judgment of God. That you'll find not only in the New Testament but also in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 1. It tells us very clearly, God calls in love, and God calls with grace, and God says, I love you. You need to be born again. You need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, so that all your sins will be wiped away, and I can show mercy unto you. And the mercy of God will bring redemption, salvation, forgiveness. I will give you a place in heaven. 
And if you say, no, I don't want mercy, no, I don't want forgiveness, no, I don't have anything to do with the love of God, then the judgment of God will fall. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 24, Proverbs chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 24, because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof i also will laugh at your calamity i will mock when your fear cometh do you see the attitude of god and do you see the principle we're referring to here all through these generations and dispensations and all these centuries the lord has been showing his mercy and the Lord Jesus Christ came so that we can be saved and redeemed and taken away from our sin. And so that the God that so loved the whole world will manifest that love to us and will come to the Lord repenting of our sins and having the salvation of the Lord. But man continues in rebellion, in rejection. And he rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. And now it says, because I've called and because I've shown mercy and because I've rejected, the time is coming when I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. And it says in verse 27, when your fear cometh as a desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish comes upon you, then shall they call upon me, and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. It said they hated the knowledge of the word of God, and they hated the offer of the salvation of the Lord. Because they have hated that, I'm going to then turn my back at them. When they call upon me, in verse, two, in verse 30, they would none of my counsel. They despise all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruits of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hackness unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. You've seen that principle now in the word of God, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God offers his mercy. And this is that offer of mercy to you, that you can be born again, you can be saved, your sins can be forgiven. There can be a change and transformation in your life. But if you reject that, if you reject the salvation of the Lord, eventually God, the God of love, becomes the God of judgment. And the judgment of God then falls. At the time of the great tribulation, the earth that had been ruled by Satan through the Antichrist, during that great tribulation, will be ruined by the judgment of God. And the Lord is doing that so that can pour his wrath, indignation, and fury upon the worshippers of the Antichrist. But that is tending to a final end. It is for the eventual reclaim, reclaiming of the earth by the Lord himself. And in this chapter, I've read it to you already from the beginning to the end. We're studying half of it today from verse 1 to verse 11. You will see that the vials of the bulls of wrath are poured out. Number one, on all the worshippers of the image of the beast that you'll find in verse 2. Number two, upon the whole earth, you still find that in verse 2. Number three, it will be poured upon the sea, you'll find that in verse 3. Number four, it will be poured upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, that's in verse 4. And then number five, it will be poured upon the sun. And then the heat, instead of being a blessing to man, will scorch men and will so heat up the earth that many, many people will die. Number six, that vial of wrath, indignation, and judgment will be poured upon the seat of the beast. That is the seat and the throne of the Antichrist. That's in verse 10. And then number seven, it will be poured upon the great river Euphrates. You'll find that in verse 12. And then number eight, it will be poured into the air. That's in verse 17. The judgment will be full and the judgment will be frightening and the judgment will be final the fullness of divine wrath on the beast worshippers that is on the beast and the worshippers of the beast let's come back to verse 1 it says and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying unto the seven angels go your ways 
and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Here he tells us very clearly, it is coming from the very temple of God, which means it is coming from the presence of God, that the judgment, the wrath, the indignation, the suffering, at the time of the great tribulation, will be coming from the presence of God, because people have rejected him. They have rejected him, and they have rejected his love, and they have rejected his salvation. Because of that rejection, then wrath, judgment, indignation suffering will come upon the people of the world at that time and it's a kind of suffering that had never never happened it will be the fullness of suffering it will be the final suffering before those people are gathered all together and sent to the lake of fire to be there forever and ever I divide the message today to three parts number one judgment and wrath of God on the earth the judgment and the wrath of God on earth. Number two, justification for the wrath of God on earth. Does God have any right? Is he justified to pour such great indignation and wrath upon the people of the world at that time? And the word of God says yes over and over. That when people have rejected mercy, God is right and God is just and God is righteous to pour his indignation and wrath upon them. Point number three is Jehovah's wrath on the godless on earth. Jehovah's wrath on the godless on earth. I come back to point number one. Judgment and wrath of God on the earth in revelation chapter 16 again i'm reading to you from verse 1 revelation chapter 16 verse 1 it says and i heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of god upon the earth I want to re-emphasize to you once again that these voices coming from the temple of God. As you look at Revelation chapter 11 verse 19. Revelation 11 verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of, the test of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. That tells you then as the door is opened. And then John the Beloved sees what is revealed from that temple coming from the very presence of God. What did he hear? What did he see? He saw the wrath of God in manifestation coming like thunder and coming like lightning, coming like voices and coming with great earthquake and with a great hail upon the people on the earth. And this is not peculiar to the revelation at all. In fact, in the Old Testament, the people of that time, if they listened to their prophets, they would have known that one that at the last time the judgment of God the wrath of God will be poured out upon this world and it will be coming right from the presence of God from the very temple of the almighty God in Isaiah chapter 66 verse 6 Isaiah chapter 66 verse 6 a voice of noise from the city and the voice from the temple and the voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies is coming from the temple of God and it is the voice of God and it is the voice of judgment and it's voice of fraud the voice of indignation and it is going to come upon the enemies of God don't you see what it says there a voice from the temple and it's a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense unto his enemies. Come back to Revelation chapter 15. In Revelation chapter 15, still telling us the same thing about this wrath and this judgment and this indignation. And the fiery fury of the Lord coming from the very temple of God at the time of the great tribulation against the people that have offended the Lord. And they refuse to repent and turn to the Lord. Revelation chapter 15 verse 7. Revelation chapter 15. 15 verse 7 it says and one of the four beasts you know that the beast here yeah, actually the original means the living creatures one of the living creatures gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of god who liveth forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of god and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven 
fallen angels were fulfilled. No man will be able to enter into the temple of God, get to the presence of God, and plead with God. You will remember in the Old Testament, whenever a plague arose, and then the judgment of God came upon the children of Israel, Aaron will rush in, because Moses will say, take the censer in your hand, and go to the presence of God, and appease the God of heaven. Because at that time, the mercy of God was still there, and the love of God was still there. But at the time of the great tribulation, there will be no mercy, there will be no love, it will be indignation and wrath and fury and judgment poured out without any mixture of mercy at all. That's why it says, no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Let's now see one by one how the vials are poured out, how the bowls of the judgment of God are poured out. And when they are poured out one by one, let us see the things that actually happens. Already we know that this is coming from the temple in heaven and that God is commanding the seven angels to pour out these bowls of wrath of God, of the wrath of God upon the earth. The period of the great tribulation will be a period period of judgment, not a period of mercy. It will be a time of wrath, not a time of love. For all the people who have rejected Christ, on, the only savior of the world. As the false veil is poured out, let us see what, ha what happens. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his veil upon the earth. And they are fairly noisome and grievous so upon the men which are the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Already we have learned from the word of God in Revelation chapter 14 that once those people receive the mark of the beast, that is the number of his name or the mark of the Antichrist, they will be doomed forever and ever. There will be no mercy at all. In fact, you are told in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 9. Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 9. It tells us there, And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, or and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night to worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The warning is there. That at the time of the great tribulation, the people that will receive the mark of the beast, the people that will follow the Antichrist, the people that will worship the Antichrist, there will be no mercy at all for them. The love of God will be forever separated, taken away from them. They will have the judgment of God. While they are still here on earth, Indignation will be poured out. Wrath will be poured out. Judgment will be poured out. And eventually they're going to die under the fury and the fire and the wrath and the indignation and the judgment of God. Then they go to a lost eternity where they will suffer forever and ever. But now, as these vials are poured out, the very first bowl of judgment that was poured out, we're told in that Revelation chapter 16 verse 2, it brought a noisome, grievous sore upon the men that had received the mark of the beast. When it says uh, so, it's like the boils that came upon the children of Egypt at a time when Pharaoh will not allow the people of God to go. In fact, uh, if you look at the things that will happen, as these things are poured out, they're very, very similar, although greater and more extensive. Greater than the thing that happened in Egypt, more extensive than the thing that happened in Egypt, but they're very similar. What's the difference? The difference is this. What happened at that time happened in a, in a single country in the land of Egypt what is going to happen at the time of the great tribulation is going to be so extensive it will cover the people that are on the earth at that time in all the countries the people that worship the antichrist and the people that take the mark of his name the mark of the beast look at Exodus chapter 9 Exodus chapter 9 reading from verse 
8. Exodus chapter 9, verse 8. You will see that the same thing had happened to the people, although this one will now be much, much greater and much more extensive. Exodus chapter 9, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh, and it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. And he took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beasts. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. That's what happened at that time. And it's still going to happen again. And that wasn't even the only time that it happened. It happened at other times too. Even in the Old Testament. You know, there was a time that uh, Ophni and Phineas has followed the ark of the Lord to the battlefield. And they were not living right. And God had predicted and prophesied through Samuel and another man of God that judgment will come upon the house of Eli because of the evil that he knew that his children were perpetrating and would not correct them. And eventually they went to the battlefield. As they got to the battlefield, the Philistines overcame them. And the Philistines took the ark of the Lord. But that is not the end of the story. Those Philistines thought, now we have conquered. And they put the ark of the Lord in the house of their God, in Ashdod. That is, in the house of Dagon. What they found out is that the following day, Dagon was falling down. But not only that, look at it now from 1 Samuel chapter 5 verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 5 verse 6. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod. And he destroyed them. And he smote them with emeralds. Even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so. They said, the ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is so upon us and upon Dagon our God. Look at verse 8. And they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto God. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after that they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And it smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. The emeralds there, those are the balls. And the souls that came up upon them. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And it came to pass as the ark of God came to Ekron. That the Ekronites cried out saying. They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel. Let it go again to his own place that he slay us not and our people. For there was a great, a deadly destruction throughout all the city. And the hand of God was very sore on them, was very heavy there. And the men that died would not was smitten with emeralds and the cry of the city went up to heaven the emeralds there the boils the swords that came upon them it had happened in the past and in the time of the great tribulation it is going to happen again and the swords will come upon them and the boils will come upon them because of the judgment of god coming upon them that's the result of the pouring out of the first vial by the first angel let's come back to revelation chapter 16 and see the second vial being poured out in verse 3 in revelation chapter 16 verse 3 and the second angel poured out out is vile upon the sea 
and it became as blood as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea again here we learn that uh, the uh, the second angel is pouring out his own vial and as the vial is poured out again we're told that the water became as blood as the blood of dead men and every living soul in the sea died as this is done you remember once again that it happened at the time of the judgment of god upon those people in egypt we're coming back to exodus again in exodus chapter 7 reading from verse 17 you will see this exactly what happened as the rivers as their waters were turned into blood Revelation, exodus chapter 7 verse 17 thus says the lord in this shall thou know that i am the lord behold i will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river and the day shall be turned to blood and the fish that is therein in the river shall die and the river shall stink and the Egyptians shall lose to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, both upon the streams, upon the rivers, upon their ponds, and upon the pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in their vessels, in vessels of wood, and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so. And the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod, and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And a fish that was in the river died. And the river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. That thing is going to be repeated again. And the second vial will be poured out by the second angel. And as we look at the third, very, very similar to the second. Look at this in Revelation chapter 16 verse 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters. And they became blood. And so the judgment of God will come upon the people of the world at that time. My prayer for you is that you will not be here at that time. Because you see, the church will not be here. The church will be raptured away when the Lord shall come. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive shall rise together with them. And we shall be caught up together with them to get into the air in the azure above. And we'll serve and worship the Lord and celebrate with the Lord. Is the people that are left behind. The people that have heard about salvation, they are not saved. The people that have heard about repentance, they have not repented. The people that have heard about following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And they refuse to be at peace with men and women. And they refuse to be holy and they are not able to see God and they miss the rapture. They will be here at the time of the great tribulation. And when these vials of wrath are being poured out, they will suffer the indignation and the judgment of God. That's the reason why if you're a wise person, you're a wise man, a wise woman, a wise boy, a wise girl, a wise person, you will call upon the Lord while he can be found. And while he's still near, you will call upon him so that you will not partake of the judgment of the great tribulation at that time. In Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 10, Jeremiah is telling us that will be the time of judgment and the time of indignation. It will not be the time of mercy at all. Jeremiah chapter 10, reading from verse 10 but the lord is the true god he is the living god an everlasting king at his wrath the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation you think about it at that time of that great tribulation when the wrath of god is being poured out upon the people of the world as a second angel is pouring out the veil upon uh, the, the the vial of wrath upon the sea making it to become blood killing all the fish there and all the creatures in the sea and as uh, the manifestation of the wrath of god also comes in the third uh, in the third pouring out of the veil 
no language will be able to fully describe the suffering that will be on earth at that time as the waters and the rivers and the fountains of waters will become blood what are they going to drink how are they going to deal with their thirst and these plagues will, att will be attended with unbearable suffering because of the disobedience and rebellions and rejection of the people and yet it's just the beginning of the torments of sinners that they will experience for all eternity once again i pray that those of us who are hearing these words will be ready for the coming of the lord because when that wrath comes and then the vials are being poured out nobody shall be able to stand nobody shall be able to abide revelation chapter 6 verse 17 in revelation chapter 6 verse 17 for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand none at all shall be able to stand this is the day of mercy and this is the day of salvation this is the day of repentance and this is the time to call upon the lord if you miss the salvation of the lord and the mercy of god and the love of god at this time nobody can assure you of the future because the rapture can take place any time from now i come to point number two justification for the wrath of god on earth you're wondering if god will do all this will it be right will it be just will it be fair on the people on the earth oh yes it will be fair it will be right it will be just because they have rejected the mercy of god not only that they have even persecuted the people that presented the mercy of god unto them revelation chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 5 revelation chapter 16 verse 5 and i had the angel of the water say thou art righteous o lord which art and was and shall be because thou hast judged thus for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy and i had another out of the altar say even so lord god almighty true and righteous are thy judgments here you'll find uh, those in heaven rejoicing and even praising the almighty God because he has done like this. And they're saying that God is true. An angel has come righteousness to God for thus judging the people on earth. These sinners did not only reject grace, they didn't only spawn the mercy of God. They didn't only refuse the salvation of the Lord. They also persecuted and killed the saints who have received the love of God and the grace of God and the salvation of the Lord. Not only that, they also persecuted and killed the prophets who offered them the saving truth of the word of God. Look at it in verse 6. It says, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink because they are worthy they are worthy of your wrath they are qualified for that indignation they are worthy of the judgment coming upon them it tells us it's because of what they have done that's why these things are coming upon them this judgment they seem terrible oh yes the severity of divine wrath will seem out of proportion to those who are ignorant of the depths of man's wickedness if we don't know how wicked men are if we don't know the rejection of man if we don't know the rebellion of man we'll think how can god do this this is too much and this is too high and this is too heavy on the people but you need to understand the wicked the depth of the wickedness of men that's why the angels that know about it all they see in all this and the act of god that is righteous bringing just retribution upon the guilty christ reject us who follow the antichrist Christ reject us who reject the atonement of the, on the cross. Christ reject us who reject the lamp of God that has been given for our salvation. And they worship the great deceiver. They deserve punishment. In fact, the Bible says they are worthy of earthly punishment as well as everlasting eternal suffering. Look at the testimony of the whole of scripture. And see what the scripture is saying concerning the judgment of God. In Psalm 119 verse 137. Psalm 119 Verse verse one three seven. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. When God judges, it is with a reason, 
and it is with a purpose and it judges the people that have rejected the love and the mercy of the almighty god it tells us in romans chapter 2 look at that again romans chapter 2 reading from verse 2 and then verse 5 in romans chapter 2 here paul the apostle talking to the church as well as to the israelites he tells us in verse 2 and but we are shown that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. Against the people that reject mercy, we're sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. Against the people that have chance, privilege of getting saved, and they refuse to get saved, the judgment of God is according to the truth. And against the people that know about the importance and the essence of holiness and refuse to be holy and refuse to be sanctified, we're sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth. Against the people that hear over and over and over. Remember, there were people in, 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 the, in the days of the Bible, in olden days, they didn't have the chance to hear like we're hearing. Bible story every Monday, Bible story every week. And then on Sunday, we're hearing the word of God. And then you have a copy of the Bible in your hand. And you have a lot of messages you can listen to at home. And you have a lot of outlines you can read at home. And then the one you can read even every day to prepare you for the coming of the Lord. You tell me, after we have rejected such provision and such grace and such mercy, and the privilege we have to give our lives to the Lord and we don't if God then judges us will he be wrong no we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such acts such things in verse 5 but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God in verse 8 but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness there will be indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the gentile we're told in revelation chapter 18 verses 20 and, and and 24 that the reason why this is will be coming upon the people of the world at that time it will be because they have shed the blood of the saints and they have shed the blood of the prophets and because they are the murderers of the people of God and the priests of God, that's why the judgment will be coming upon them. Revelation chapter 18 verse 20, rejoice over her. Thou heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. They killed those apostles and they killed the prophets of God. And he shed the blood of the saints and the blood of the prophets. And because of that, judgment is not coming upon them in verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all that was slain upon the earth. That's why the judgment of God will be coming upon them. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 29, the word of God is warning us to that now we have the privilege of getting saved and the privilege of calling upon the lord and the privilege of knowing the lord and if we do not know the lord with all the privileges that are given to us if we don't get saved we don't get sanctified don't become holy and we remain in our sins that the judgment of god will fall upon any of us that reject the mercy of god hebrews chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 from verse 29 Hebrews 10 verse 29 of how much sorrow punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and on an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace do you understand that verse that verse is talking about those who are saved before in fact, he's talking about those who are even sanctified before. And they had the spirit of grace in their lives before. There was a time when they gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a time when they became born again. There was a time when they became new creatures in Christ. There was a time when they were warning other people not to continue in sin. There were times in the past when they said, Lord, I give myself to you. I will live a righteous life. Thank you for what you did for me on the cross of Calvary. But the time came in their lives. They looked back. They turned back. They backslid. 
And they went back into the sin that they rejected before. And then, not only that, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, appearing to them through his servants, through the preachers, through the prophets, through the apostles, through the evangelists, pleading with them, why will you die? Why will you perish? You know about salvation. You know about the peace of God. Come. Come back and be restored. Don't stay in the far country like a burning out son. And then they push the preachers now, and they push Jesus Christ now, and then they tread under their feet the Son of God. And then the blood of the covenant wherewith they were sanctified in the past, they count it as an unholy, unholy thing. And they say, that thing doesn't matter to me anymore. I don't regard the blood of Jesus anymore. It means nothing to me anymore. And then the spirit of grace pleading with them. They do despite of that spirit of grace until they so harden themselves that the spirit of God will no more wrestle with them in their hearts. That's why it says in verse 30, for we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And then he tells us in verse 31, if you backslide, and you refuse to come back. If you backslide and you remain adamant in sin and you die in that backsliding, the Lord Jesus is going to be your judge. And the Lord is warning us in verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's the reason why the Lord himself is warning us through all these messages we're hearing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men. And you as a child of God, that's what you need to do. You need to move about and persuade men. Especially men that have known the Lord before. But now they are backsliding. Men that have known the Lord before, they have gone back into sin. And they have left their first stage. And they have left their first love. And now they are rolling in sin and enjoying sin. We need to go to them knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. Not only that the people that have not been born again. They are still in their sins. We are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the soul winners and the preachers of the gospel. And we need to go to those sinners and tell them. Huh, judgment is coming. All will be there. All who have refused, all who have rejected. Why don't you come to the Lord today? Knowing therefore the judgment of God will persuade men. And if you have any relative, a wife, a husband, a child, or a parent that is uh, rejecting the salvation of the Lord, you know the terror of the Lord. You know the judgment that is coming. And that thing should be burning within your soul. And should be going to your relatives and to people that are near to you. Knowing the terror of God will persuade men you are calling upon them that they ought to give their lives to the Lord but you are not only doing that to, believe, to unbelievers you are even going to the believers you are telling the believers be careful be watchful and make sure you are very you are watching in your life because if you do not remain in the salvation the Lord has given you when the Lord will come you will be left behind be very watchful in your life in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17 and if ye call on the, on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work pass the time of your sojourning here in fear what if judgment comes at the time you are careless? What if you die after you are backsliding and there's no chance to repent? That's why it says you pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now, what's the way of escape? Especially as we read in Revelation chapter, come back to Revelation, Revelation chapter 16, and we're looking at it from verse 5. In the light of these verses of scripture, and I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. What does that mean? They persecuted the saints of God. They persecuted members of the body of Christ. They persecuted children of God, the saints. Not only that, they persecuted the preachers, the prophets. And because they persecuted the preachers, the prophets, those who are showing them the way of salvation, that's why the judgment of God is coming upon them. And thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. 
And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. What's the Lord saying to you there? Maybe you're like Saul of Tarsus. And you're persecuting the people of God. And you're persecuting the prophets of God. What's the Lord saying unto you? So that you'll escape the judgment that is to come upon the world. And upon the people that have persecuted the saints and the prophets. He's telling you number one, repent of the violence in your hand. You see, these people, they were violent against the saints of God. They were violent against the prophets of God. And the number one thing the Lord is telling you is repent. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 8. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 8. This is what the Lord is calling you to. You're persecuting saints. You're persecuting believers. You're persecuting members of the body of Christ. Repent. Jonah chapter 3, verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. If you may violent against the saints of God, maybe your wife is a Christian. And you're not happy with that. Because she doesn't want to be like Jezebel. She wants to present herself like a godly woman of the Bible. And that irritates you and that annoys you. And you're persecuting her. Maybe you're a woman and you have your method of persecuting your husband. Because she's taking his stand on the unchanging word of God. Earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And is living that new life. All things pass away. All things becoming new. And therefore you think that the whip is in the hand of you, the wife, to whip your husband and to beat him back, back into the world. Or maybe you are a parent or you are persecuting your child. The Lord is saying that violence against the child. The violence against the husband. The violence against your relatives who have become children of God repent of them repent of the violence in your hand in verse 9 who can tell if God will turn and repent and uh, turn away from the fierce anger is fierce anger that we perish not number two refrain number one you repent number two refrain what does that mean what it means you will find in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 Acts chapter 5 reading from verse 38 now I say unto you refrain from these men and let them alone for if this counsel or this work be of god it will come to it be if this counsel and or this work be of man it will come to naught but if it be of god ye cannot overthrow it let's happily ye be found even to fight against god You've been persecuting the saints of God or the prophets of God. And now you want the mercy of God. What are you to do? Refrain. Stop persecuting them. Leave them alone. Leave these men alone. If the work be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest you be found fighting against the almighty God. Are you persecuting your wife? Are you persecuting your husband? Are you persecuting your children? Are you persecuting the people of God, the preachers of the gospel? Refrain. Leave all that alone. And just force, face your own life. That you too, you need to repent. What they have got, the peace of God they have got, the salvation of God they have got, the joy of God they have got, the victory of God they have got in their soul. You need it in your soul too. Number three, reproof. If you see other people who have joined you persecuting the saints and persecuting the prophets of God, the preachers of the word of God, reprove them. Ex that's exactly what God Almighty himself even does. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 21 and 22, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. You, you find anyone, maybe a friend of yours, and is bragging on how he persecutes the saints of God, how he is persecuting the children of God, and is saying, I'm going to bring that saint of God, that child of God, that woman, that man, I'm going to bring them down and make them backslide. The way I persecute them, reprove them, talk to them. Why do you do that? Or are you persecuting the people that love the Lord? And then if they are bragging, I persecute the preachers of the gospel, I persecute the prophets, reprove them. Number one, you repent. Number two, you refrain. Number three, you reprove. Number four, release. Release them. You have tied them up, persecuting them, holding them down, 
hindering them, oppressing them, release them. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 35. Acts chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeant saying, let those men go, Re release them. You are binding them up. They should be working for God. And they should have all the freedom to serve the Lord. Those saints of God that have promised the Lord, they will serve the Lord till they die. Now, by your persecution, you are tying them. You are restricting them. You are hindering them. You are bottling them up. Release them. Don't persecute them. Let them go free and serve the Lord as they want to serve the Lord. And those preachers of the gospel that want to preach the totality of the word of God, you are hurting them, you are harming them, you are persecuting them, you are tying them down, you are imprisoning them, you are holding them in captivity. Release them. Remove your hand of persecution away from them. In verse 36, and the keeper of the prison told, they are saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. Look at verse 40. And when they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Release them to their ministry. Let them do their work without any hindrance. Number one, you repent. Number two, you refrain. Number three, you reprove. Number four, you release. Number five, respect them. The respect and the honor you give to a saint of God, you are giving it to the Lord himself. The respect and the honor you give to the preachers of the gospel, you are giving to the Lord himself. Respect the saints of God. Respect the servants of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. That's the word of God. You have nothing else to do but to respect them. Don't persecute them. Repent of the persecution. Refrain from touching the people of God. Reprove your friends who are touching the anointed of the Lord. Release the people you are tying up so that they cannot serve the Lord with the freedom of heart and freedom of mind. And then respect those people of God who are preaching the word of God unto us. And the people that are living as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And they want to show forth the glory of God. If there is anything you need to do, you need to respect them. Number six, refresh them. Refresh them. Be an encouragement to the people that are serving the Lord. The saints of God, the prophets of God. Refresh them in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 17. 16, 17. I am glad of the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit. They release me. And they refresh my spirit. And I feel fresh in my spirit. And I feel the life of God within my soul. And I feel renewed because they are ministering to me. They are not hindering me. They are not disturbing me. They are not persecuting me. They are not tying me down. They are not tying me up. They refresh my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge them that are such. And then receive them receive them when those saints come to you don't persecute them when those saints are showing you the standard by the way they live receive them and when those uh, prophets and preachers are preaching the word of god to you getting you ready for the coming of the lord receive them we're looking at third john verses seven and eight third john verses seven and eight because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. They're spending their energy. They're spending their time. They're spending their life to bring the word of truth and the word of salvation to the people that are lost. Taking nothing of the Gentiles were therefore all to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. How do we receive them? You see that in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 14. Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 14. And my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despise not, but 
nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Don't persecute the saints. Receive them. Receive them like you receive an angel. Receive them like you receive the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If Jesus were to come here today to minister to you directly, that's how to receive the saints of God, and that's how to receive the prophets of God even as an angel of God, as Christ himself. Is that just man, preacher, saying that? Look at what Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 and 41. Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 and 41. If we are going to escape the judgment of the people that uh, persecute the sins of God and persecute the prophets of God, here is what we are to do. Number one, you repent of any persecution you have been putting on the people of God. Number two, you refrain from touching them anymore. Number three, you repent prove your friends who are touching them number four you release them into their ministry number five respect them honor them honor them respect them number six you refresh them number seven receive them in matthew chapter 10 verses 40 and 41 he that receiveth you receiveth me and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Come back to Revelation chapter 16. The reason why the judgment of God came upon these people is because they did not repent of the violence in their hands. And they did not turn away from all the injuries and indignities they did to the saints of God and the prophets of God. And the Lord is telling us, if you're being like that yourself, and you've been persecuting the saints of God and the prophets of God, judgment will come except you repent. I pray, Lord, I pray that the Lord will give every one of us all the repentance that we need so we can have the mercy and the forgiveness and the salvation of the Lord in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen there. I come to point number three, Jehovah's wrath on the godless on earth. Jehovah's wrath on the godless on earth. I read from Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 8 now. It says, and the fourth angel poured out his fire upon the sun, and power was given unto, was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Stop right there. It says that at that time, when the fourth angel will pour out the vial of wrath it will be upon the sun and men will be scorched with great heat since the creation of the world god has made the sun to be of great and positive benefit to both the godly and the ungodly but during the great tribulation the sun which had been a source of blessing for many centuries will become an instrument of wrath an instrument of judgment the heat of the sun will become so intense that many will die from its effect the vast majority of the worshippers of the antichrist who bear or carry his mark or his name on them will die from the effect of an overwhelming sunburn yet dying will not relieve them of the suffering of excessive heat in hell. I've read it to you already that if any man worship the beast or his image and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone forever and ever. But here on earth, at the time of the great tribulation, when the sun will increase in its heat tremendously, many, many people are going to die of that terrible heat. I want you to look at uh, Revelation chapter 8. You'll, you'll find that uh, this is not the first time. In fact, uh, earlier at the time of the great tribulation, uh, such a terrible punishment had come upon the people as the, uh, as the angel will, will affect the sun and then the galaxies of heaven and it will affect them so much that many many people are going to suffer for that in revelation chapter 8 and in verse 12 and the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was 
meeting and a third part of the moon and a third part of the stars so as the third part of them was darkened the day shone not and for the third part of it and the night likewise you see at the tribulation time the sun will be affected the stars will be affected and the moon will be affected too and in this one we're reading today in revelation chapter 16 what is going to happen is that it is going to be terrible judgment upon the sun and then the scorching heat will be terrible upon the people the lord jesus christ gave an indication of this when he was talking to the people before he left this earth in luke chapter 21 luke chapter 21 reading from verse 25 and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars upon the earth distress of nations were perplexity the sea and the waves roaring men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken it's going to be such a terrible thing and then we're told in isaiah chapter 24 isaiah chapter 24 at that time of the great tribulation what is going to happen to the people of the world people on earth at that time isaiah chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 1 all through to verse 6 Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the, with the master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the bar, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury. It's going to affect everyone. The, the scorching of the sun, and the judgment, and the heat, and the suffering, and the perdition coming upon the people at the time of the great tribulation in verse 3 it says the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled uh, for the Lord has spoken his word the earth shall the earth mourneth and fadeth away the world languishes and fadeth away and the haughty people of the earth do languish the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws and changed the ordinance and broken the everlasting covenant Therefore, as the curse devouch the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate, therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burnt, and few men left in it. Few men left. Do you see then the judgment that will come upon the people? But what's the reaction when the judgment is coming? Come back to Revelation chapter 16. As the sun of the of the as the heat of the sun is scorching them, making people to die of sunburn. What will be their attitude? Will, will they say, Oh God, we're sorry? because of the judgment that you have brought upon us we know it is because we're sinners please have mercy upon us no they don't talk like that at all uh, have you found people that when they have sinned and the lord has watched them and the lord has pleaded with them and the lord has called them and the lord has promised them he will save them he will forgive them but they keep on sinning and then the lord wanting to recover them he lays discipline chastisement upon them do you know it is not everybody that has chastisement of di or discipline that repents we even see it in the church that sometimes uh, you know you'll be showing love and mercy and grace and forbearance unto some people and then you feel that well if they are not repenting of their sins after the mercy and the love and the graciousness of the lord has been revealed to them they need to be disciplined and then you discipline them and you are thinking that now that discipline chastisement rebuke has come upon them they're going to repent pastor overseer state overseer region overseer if you think like that you are wrong you're mistaken in fact we have known that when people are under discipline instead of repenting and turning away from their sins they still continue to blaspheme and they still continue to show that they are not going to turn to the lord and they're not going to turn and receive the mercy of god that's exactly what the people did here you know it is not a new thing human nature is always the same and as it is now so will it be at that time that even when the judgment of god will come upon them and the chastisement of god will come upon them instead of repentance they will still blaspheme the name of the lord in fact they're going to increase in sin 
church leaders who are there listening to me, overseers, region overseers, state overseers, does that mean then that, well, we shouldn't rebuke anybody after all? If you rebuke them, if you discipline them, they're still going to rebel more and more. Therefore, hands down, leave them alone, let them destroy the kingdom of God. No, I'm not saying that. You still have to do that. You look at this. The Lord knew that they will not repent. The Lord knew that the punishment and the chastisement and the discipline will not correct them, will not bring them to salvation, and yet he still continue pouring the vials of wrath upon them. That's the righteousness of God. And so church leaders, even if the people are, going, are not going to repent, do what is right. Even if they're going to become worse, do what is right. Sin must be punished. And sin must be judged. Even if those sinners and backsliders are going to rebel more and more, keep on doing it. Don't get tired. God is never tired. Be a child of God and follow after the principles and the pattern of the Lord. Look at their reaction after the chastisement and the discipline. We're looking at Revelation chapter 16. In Revelation chapter 16 verse 9, And men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him the glory. Yeah, that's what they did. In fact, we are told in Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 18. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 18, it tells us uh, the same thing about uh, these uh, people. Revelation chapter 9, verse 18. By these three was a third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. And then in verse 20, and the rest of the men which were not killed with these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship the devils and the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. It's, it's wonderful for you to be like God. And, and you fathers and mothers at home, you know sometimes you correct your children. And the more you correct them, the more those children are adamant. And they say, daddy will get tired. Mommy will get tired. Daddy and mommy don't get tired. As long as they keep on doing things that merit rebuke and correction, chastisement and discipline, give it to them. Because it is that rod of correction that you will eventually rescue them from hell. Don't get tired. If they are not tired of disobedience and rebellion, don't get tired of correction. And God was not tired. Although the people will not receive the correction, although the people will not receive the rebuke, the Lord still continued. That's why you'll find it tells us now Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16 and in verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and again they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and because of their souls and they repented not of their deeds. Here we find what the Lord has done. The outpouring of the vial of wrath of the feast angel was upon the seat, upon the throne of the beast. That is of the Antichrist. God's judgment had been global over every part of the earth. But now God's wrath is poured upon the throne of the Antichrist. And his kingdom was full of darkness and they not their tongues for pain. There will be terrible anguish, yet men will refuse to repent. Now you tell me, when neither love nor wrath will convert a man, when neither God's goodness nor God's severity and judgment will lead man to repentance, what do you think will remain? Eternal punishment will be inescapable. And that's why you're asking yourself, you'll be hearing the word of God over and over. What's your attitude? What's your response to the word of God? Shouldn't this word of God lead us to repentance and make, it to, make us to check our lives to see whether we're ready for the coming of the Lord or not? Isaiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 13. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them. The people of this world don't be like them. They do not turn. They do not repent. The people turneth not unto him that smiteth them. Neither do they seek the Lord 
of hosts. In Jeremiah chapter 5, Jeremiah chapter 5, reading from verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3. Here it tells us, O Lord, and not thine eyes upon the truth, thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. How about this? You have rebuked them. You have chastised them. You have stricken them. But they have not grieved for their sin. Thou hast consumed them, but they have, not, they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. And that's the people who are hiding in sin. That's the people who have gone beyond the time and beyond the privilege of redemption. Those are the people that have gone beyond the time and the privilege of the grace of God. But the Lord is telling us we shouldn't be like that in Sephaniah chapter 3. Sephaniah chapter 3. And I'm reading to you from verse 7. Sephaniah chapter 3. Verse 7. I said, surely thou will fear me. Thou will receive instruction. So their dwelling shall not be cut off. Whosoever Howsoever I punish them, but they rose early and they corrupted all their doings. The Lord said, I'm going to correct them. I'm going to chastise them. That will make them repent and return unto me. And then the Lord is saying, Howsoever, whatever method I used, chastising them, correcting them, bringing them to myself, they corrupted all their doings. But the Lord is challenging us and warning us in love in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. It's telling us from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 11. It says, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Now he's talking about the children of Israel there. Eventually they went on and on and on until the Lord said it's over. They will not enter into my rest. Now he comes to us and he, he, he tries to uh, tell us to, not to be like them. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. Don't encourage one another in sin. Don't encourage one another in rebellion. Don't encourage one another in backsliding. Don't encourage people that are falling to remain on the ground. Tell them to rise up. Use the truth in a positive way. And tell them to come back to the Lord. That they need to know the Lord. That except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If a man dies as an unbeliever, as a backslider, he will perish. Love your friends to the point you are able to warn them and exhort them. It says exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hiding through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. As in the provocation. Harden not your heart. You see the people we're reading about in the book of Revelation. You know why? They were not redeemed. And you know why there's no mercy for them? They've gone beyond the day of their grace. And when chastisement came, when correction came, they will not yield unto the Lord. And the Lord is saying, don't do it like that. As in the day of provocation, harden not your heart. I'm reading from, to you from Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest seat to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Uh, the Lord is asking us, uh, why are we sitting still? Why are we just folding our arms? And why are we not getting up and getting away from our sins? Why are we remaining in evil? Why is any backslider remaining in backsliding? When there's a privilege of coming to the Lord today and getting saved and getting reconciled unto the Lord, restored to the grace of God. I believe that today, those who are backsliding, you'll come back to the Lord. 
I said you'll come back to the Lord. And those who have not been born again, you've been coming to the church for such a long time. And you refuse to give your life to the Lord. Today is the day of your salvation. You must be born again. What if the rapture happens and then you're coming to church, coming to Bible study, and then you are not born again? What will happen to you? Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 14. Why do we sit still? Why don't we go to God? Why don't we call upon God? Why do we sit, sit still? In verse 20 it says the harvest is past and the summer is ended and we're not saved. There are people there. The summer is almost gone. And the harvest is almost gone. And you are coming and coming. You have not been born again. Your life is not new. In verse 22, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? The Lord is calling you and the Lord is saying, why do you wait? Why do you tarry so long? The Savior is waiting to give you a place among the sanctified throng. What do you hope to gain by further delay? There is no one that can save you except Jesus Christ. There's no other way but his way. Do you not feel his spirit now striving within you? Why not accept his salvation and throw up your body of sin? Why do you wait? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to bless you. There is danger and death. If you delay, this is the time to call upon the Lord. Rise up on your feet. What well, Jesus is still whispering to you, come, backslider, come. While we're praying for you and we're concerned, come, sinner, come. Now is the time to own him and now is the time to know him. Come, come to the Lord today. Are you too heavy laden? Come, sinner, come. Jesus will, will remove your burden. Come, sinner, come. Jesus will not deceive you. And Jesus can receive you and save you now. Come to the Lord. Turn away from your sin. Give yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I give myself to you. I surrender myself to you. Oh, here is tender pleading. Come, sinner, come. Come and receive his blessing. Come, backslider, come. While well, Jesus whispers to you, and while we are praying for you, this is the best time that you will come to the Lord. I expect everybody to stand up. And you pray to the Lord and you talk to the Lord. That's why you came to the Bible study. I don't want any rebellion continuing while I'm talking to you to call you to the Lord. This is the time to call upon the name of the Lord. That the Lord will touch your heart. And it will search in that hard heart. And that rebellious heart. And that heart that is refusing the grace of God. That you give yourself to the Lord so you can be born again. Why do you tarry? Why do you wait back in sin? Call upon the name of the Lord, that the Lord himself will have mercy upon you. The soul that sinneth it shall die. I have seen the judgment of God being poured out upon the people at the time of the great tribulation. And except you are born again, you will not make it at the time of the rapture. That's why we're calling upon you. That's why we're talking to you. That's why we're saying, repent today. Today is the day of salvation. Why do you sit still? Why do you stay behind? Why are you wasting time? Why don't you give your life to the Lord? And why don't you allow the Lord to take that stubbornness away, that stony heart away, and that self-will away, and break the heart of stone? Why don't you come to the Lord? If love will not draw you, and judgment will not draw you, if mercy will not draw you, and uh, the judgment of God will not draw you, if the staff of the Lord will not draw you, and the rod of the Lord will not draw you where is the home but you can call upon the lord today you can say lord i come lord i come i repent of my sin i give myself to the lord i want you lord to have mercy upon me if you're backsliding you know about it if you've gone back into adultery into fornication into lying into worldliness into carnality into disobedience into rebellion if you have gone back into stealing if you have gone back into 419 business if you have gone into polygamy if you have gone into marrying second wife, if you have gone away from your husband, you have gone to another man. If you have gone into evil, the Lord knows your situation, he knows your heart. And the Lord is calling you today. Why will you not repent? Call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. I give myself to you afresh. If you have fallen, rise up. 
If you are backsliding, come back. If you are like the prodigal son, like your prodigal daughter, you have gone into the far country, come back to the Lord. The Lord wants to save you. The Lord wants to restore you. The Lord wants to change your life. If you have gone back into lying, if you have gone back into stubbornness, if you have gone back into being heady, you can come back to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I give myself to you. I surrender myself to you today. What are you going to gain by disobedience and rebellion and backsliding and sinning? Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. The Lord has not called us to uncleanness. He has called us unto holiness. And who shall see the Lord? Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? They that have clean hands and a pure heart. The Lord is expecting that you will pray unto the Lord. He will cleanse your life. He will cleanse your heart and blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God if you wait until the time of the great tribulation the time of the great tribulation is going to be a time of serious judgment and it's going to be a time of fire indignation that is poured out upon people but the Lord is calling you today that you will not gamble with your soul you will not gamble with your salvation you will not gamble with your eternal life Call upon the name of the Lord and let him turn your life around. That's why you came to the Bible study. You want to know the Lord. That's why you came. You want to escape the great tribulation. That's why you came. You want to escape the judgment of God. That's why you came. You want to escape all the indignation of the Lord that will come upon the unbelievers, upon the sinners. That's why you came. Call upon the name of the Lord. If you turn away from your sin, he will pardon you. If you turn away from your sin, he will forgive you. If you turn away from your sin it will wash you with the blood of the lamb and you will never be the same again and then he will give you grace he will give you new life and young people who are there that's why we come to church we come to church so that the hand of the Lord can touch our hearts and the hand of the Lord can touch our soul and our spirit and then we will be able to live victoriously above sin whosoever is born of God does not commit sin the seed of God remains in him and he cannot sin he cannot sin he will not sin because he's born of God. Hearing the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not do righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. I give myself. I surrender myself unto you. I give myself. I surrender myself unto you. I will not play with my soul anymore. I will not gamble with my salvation anymore. I give myself to you. I surrender myself to you. Call upon the name of the Lord today. Repent of the violence in your hand. Repent of the evil in your hand. And say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. You want to be serious with getting to heaven. You don't want to play religion. You don't want to become a Pharisee or a Sadducee. Right here in the house of God. You want to be a real child of God so you can escape the judgment that is coming upon the world of unbelievers. Upon the world of back sliders call upon the name of the lord that god himself will have mercy upon you god will have mercy upon you so that you will not perish in your sin god is no respect of persons the soul that sinneth it shall die god is no respect of persons the soul that sinneth it shall die don't let the devil blindfold you to your salvation and to the grace of god and to the mercy of god call upon the name of the lord and for this, once be serious in your life, so that you will not perish with the people that perish. Call upon the name of the Lord. If you are backsliding, come back to the Lord. And you confess those sins to the Lord one by one. And say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. I surrender. I give myself unto you. I want to serve you. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. I want to serve you. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. I want to follow after you all the days of my life. And I want to remain firm with conviction, standing on the word of God. I don't want to go back into sin. Lord, have mercy upon me. And the Lord says, I'll sprinkle clean water upon you. And ye shall be clean. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. And ye shall be clean. And then after you are saved and you are converted and he cleanses you, he says, and I will take the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a new heart. I'll give you a new spirit. And then I will put within you a heart of flesh. That means I'll circumcise you. 
That means I'll sanctify you. That means I'll purify you. That means I'll make you holy within. I'll make your spirit holy. I'll make your heart holy. I'll make you holy within and without through and through. And then after that it says I'll pour my spirit upon you. I'll pour my spirit upon you. And ye shall walk in my statutes and do my judgments. And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses. Both in Jerusalem and in Judea. And, to the, and also in Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. Come to the Lord. Have all these indispensable essential experiences that you need in the Lord. And say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. I want to follow you. I want to worship you. I want to serve you in spirit and in truth and in all sincerity. Come to the Lord today and let the Lord himself do a great work in your heart. Salvation is a great work. Salvation is a great work. And how will you escape? How will you escape? How will you escape? If you neglect so great salvation, so great salvation, so great salvation, since you've been coming, have you been born again? Since you've been coming, have you been born again? Since you've been coming, have you been born again? Is there a new life there? Have you forsaken your sin? Are you victorious over sin? Is the Spirit of God bearing witness in your heart? You are victorious. Victorious in church and victorious outside the church. Victorious in the office and victorious at home. Victorious and you are victorious over every form of sin in your life. And have you been sanctified? Are you united with Christ? Are you united with the pastor? Are you united with the people of God? That is the mark, one of the marks of sanctification. Are you humble? Are you, are you submissive to the will of God and the word of God? Are you walking in the highway of holiness? That's what it takes, my brother. That's what it takes, my sister. So that you'll be able to make it on that final day. Call upon the name of the Lord so that your coming to the Bible study will not be a waste, will not be a useless effort. You are now the Lord to actually do real work of conversion, real work of grace in your heart. And then you allow him that he will sanctify you. He will purify you. And then you walk in the highway of holiness every moment of the day and every day of the week and every week of the month. And you are walking consistently. And you're an example of the believers in word and in truth and in charity and in, and in conversation and in purity. You will be an example to the believers. Pray that the Lord will help you. That you will escape the judgment of God. It is coming. It is coming. The rapture will take place any time from now. And after the saints of God have gone... Then those of us that are let, those who are left behind, they will suffer, they will go through the great tribulation. And I'm ready to you from the word of God, the vows of judgment and the vows of wrath and the vows of indignation being poured out upon the people of this world. When the people of God have gone away in the rapture. That's why you don't want to remain here at the time of that great tribulation. Tell the Lord that the Lord will help you so that you will not be here at that time. Pray until you know the work is done in your heart. And you'll never be the same again. And then if the rapture will take place anytime, the trumpet shall blow anytime. You'll be able to go with the people of God.